All right, uh, let's get into our study uh, today in the Word of God. Open up with me, if you will, to 1 Corinthians chapter number 15. 1 Corinthians chapter number 15. We're continuing our look verse by verse through our Apostle Paul's book of 1 Corinthians. Uh, we're, we're dealing with the physical bodily resurrection and how many of the believers, there are some, let me say, not many, but some, how say some of you that there is no resurrection from the dead. Now Paul, in this part of the passage, he's going to deal with what types of bodies will we have at the resurrection and so forth. So let's look at that. Look with me, if you will, at verse number 32. Paul, uh, we saw last time, a couple of weeks ago, last week we did that special message, but a uh, topical message, but uh, a couple of weeks ago we saw that Paul is saying that he goes through all of these sufferings because he has a hope of, if he dies, there's a resurrection and he's going to be there with the Lord, rewarded for his sufferings. He says in verse 32, if after the matter of men I have fought with beasts at Ephesus. Two weeks ago we saw that both Jude and, and Peter calls men beast. In fact, the Antichrist is going to be called the beast, okay? He's called the beast. So men who have such base uh, um, uh, characteristics that they're compared to brute beast, okay? Well, Paul dealt with men like that in Ephesus. If you go with me, go with me back to Acts 19. I said I would take you back to Acts. Um, look at Acts chapter 19 when Paul was at Ephesus. He caused such a stir, such an uproar, that men were literally trying to kill him. Paul says in Acts 20, he says, bonds and affliction abide me. Everywhere he went, the satanic policy of evil was trying to hinder and to destroy uh, not only his faith, but to actually stop what God was doing in building up the body of Christ, saving uh, Jews and Gentiles in that day. Well, Paul says... He's, he's going to be killed all the day long. He dies daily. He always bears about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus that the life of the Lord Jesus might be manifest, 2 Corinthians. Well, let's look at Acts chapter 19. Go down to verse 23. Paul is at Ephesus. Uh, look at chapter 19. Just look at verse 1 for context. And it came to pass that while Apollos was at Corinth, that was Acts 18, Paul left Corinth, Paul, having passed through the upper coast, came to Ephesus and finding certain disciples there. So Paul is going to now have his ministry at Ephesus, okay? He's going to write back to the Ephesians in the book of Ephesians, as we know. But look at verse number 23. Paul's there. And the same time there arose no small, no small stir about that way, and that was the way of the Lord, for a certain man named Demetrius, a silversmith, which made silver shrines for Diana, brought no small gain unto the craftsmen. Uh, Diana was that goddess of, of the Ephesians, and she had the great uh, uh, temple and so forth, and they would make these idols, and this man Demetrius, was make, he was getting rich off of the religious system. Uh, Catholicism does that in many other religions where they make money off of different idols and so forth. And what Paul's going to do is cause problems because he's saying there is no God made with hands. But there's a true and living God. Well, notice in verse 24. This man Demetrius, a silversmith, he, he made silver shrines for Diana and brought no small gain unto the craftsmen. That means he was he was lucrative business. Hey Rich, good morning. I'll put you guys right over there. Thank you. All right. All right. We're in uh, Acts chapter number 19. Verse 25 whom he called together with the workmen of like occupation and said, Sirs, ye know that by this craft we have our wealth. Look at verse 25, Acts 19, 25. It says, whom he called. So Demetrius called, verse number 25, whom he called together with the workmen of like occupation. This was big business in that day, just like it is today, these making of idols. And they sold these idols to religious people, the superstitious religious people, who would use these idols then to worship their gods and goddesses. Notice in verse 25. Sirs, ye know that by this craft <laughs> we have our wealth. See, they were wealthy off of religion, and religion makes you wealthy. Moreover, ye see and hear that not alone at Ephesus, but almost throughout all Asia, that's that then known world, uh, Asia Minor or Turkey, this Paul hath persuaded and turned away much people, saying, 
that there be no gods which are made with hands. Look at that. The religious system says there's all these gods, and Paul says, no, 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 there's no gods made with hands. There's only one living and true God. Verse 27. So that not only this our craft is in danger to be set at naught. Paul was going to put them all out of business if you give them a chance. But watch this. But also that the temple of the great goddess Diana should be despised, and her magnificence should be destroyed, whom all Asia and the world worship it. It was a worldwide religion. And that religion was profitable for these men. These men didn't care about the religion per se. They were just in it to make money, just like religious people who do all these things today. Now think about what, what happens. He says, the temple of the great goddess Diana. If I'm not mistaken, you've heard of the seven wonders of the ancient world or something like that? You still have the Babylonian hanging gardens of Nebuchadnezzar. One of them, I believe, is this temple of the great goddess Diana. One of the seven wonders of the ancient world. Well, look at verse 28. And when they heard these things, they were full of wrath and cried out, saying, Great is Diana of the Ephesians. Great is Diana of the Ephesians. You know what religious people say? They just have this mantra. Great, great. They, they just go, you know, our God is great. Our God is great. They did it back then. Verse number 29. But notice the confusion. And the whole city was filled with what? Confusion. God's not the author of confusion, so we know it's satanic. And having called Gaius and Aristarchus, these were Paul's companions, men of Macedonia, Paul's companions in travel, they rushed with one accord into the theater. Now Paul was very bold, especially after in Acts 14, he was literally stoned to death. God raised him up. So he was, he was bold as our apostle. Verse 30, And when Paul would have entered in unto the people, the, the disciples suffered him not. Notice God working through these saints. Says, Apostle Paul, don't go in there, man. They'll kill you. Verse number 31. And certain of the chief of Asia, which were his friends, sent unto him, desiring him that he would not adventure himself into the theater. Paul was bold. He was going to go in and deal with all these thousands of people. Well, look at this. Verse 32. Some therefore cried one thing, and some another. For the assembly was confused. And the more part knew not wherefore they were come together. Can I tell you, this happens even today. My wife has a brother, both her brothers in armed forces. One was a Marine. One is still, uh, he's in, he was in the Army. Act, he's, he's on uh, uh, active duty. He's not active duty, but he's uh, reserve. And he, he was telling us, her older brother, Gary, he said that when he went over to the Middle East to deal with it, those Muslims, he says that they would just start chanting about something and didn't even know what it was about. They just see a group chanting, they, they went and start chanting, and they, they're fighting against the cause, and they don't even know what the cause was. And every time I read that, I don't even know if he knows this is in the scripture, I think about that. That's what religion will do. They don't even know why they're shouting. They're just shouting because everybody else is shouting. It's like riots and stuff. People just join riots, not because they're trying to fight a cause at times. They're just rioting just to, for riots. Sake. Well, that was these people. And these are the things that Paul dealt with a lot, but especially here at Ephesus. Verse number 33. I mean, they didn't even know why they were coming. Look at the end of verse 32. And the more part, most of the people knew not whereof they were coming together. That's religion for you. Keep going. Verse 33. And they drew Alexander out of the multitude, the Jews putting him forward, and Alexander beckoned with the hand, and would have made his defense unto the people. But when they knew that he was a Jew, because now you're dealing with Gentiles here at Ephesus, all with one voice about the space of two hours cried out, Great is Diana of the Ephesians. If you want to see this, you can, you can go to websites. You can, we, we have technology now. Even in some of these Islamic countries, they will, ch they will chant, Alu Akbar, Alu Akbar. God is great for hours on end. But no, just, just chant. Well, that was what they were doing with the great goddess Diana of the Ephesians. Verse 35. And when the town clerk had appeased the people, so the guy who was in charge, he calmed the people down. He said, ye men of Ephesus, what man is there that knoweth? Not how that the city of the Ephesians is a worshiper of the great goddess Diana, and of the image which fell down from Jupiter. You know, I was thinking about Islam. They have an image that's supposedly falling down from the heavens as well. Verse 36. Seeing then that these things cannot be spoken against, 
ye ought to be quiet and do nothing rashly. So he's trying to keep peace, civil peace, okay? Verse number 37, if you will. For ye have brought hither these men, which are neither robbers of churches, nor yet blasphemers of your goddess. By the way, notice Paul never even spoke against the, 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 their goddess. He just said the truth. He just said there's no gods which are made of metal, stone, rock. It's a living God. He didn't attack them personally. He just says, hey, he gave them the truth. Verse 38. Wherefore, if Demetrius and the craftsmen which are with him have a matter against any man, the law is open. See that lawful civil discourse. And there are deputies. Let them and plead one another. So he says there's a rational way to deal with it. Go to law and deal with it. Don't, don't go and take the law in your own hand. Verse 39. But if ye inquire anything concerning other matters, it shall be determined in a lawful assembly. For we are in danger to be called in question for this, uh, this day's uproar. What he means by that, if the Roman government back in Rome, Italy, find out that there's this insurrection there, they're going to come down harsh on that, on that uh, particular area. All right, let's keep going. Verse 40 and 41. For we are in danger to be called in question for this day's uproar, there being no cause whereby we may give an account of this concourse. You know what he's saying? How am I going to explain all this writing just because a man said that there's no gods made with, with, with hands? It wouldn't even, it wouldn't even make sense to, to them. And when he had thus spoken, he dismissed the assembly. Well, I want you to see it's that type of stuff when he says, go back to uh, uh, 1 Corinthians 15. Go back to 1 Corinthians 15. That's a glimpse of what the Apostle Paul was dealing with when he was at um, when, when he was speaking to the Corinthians about his, uh, his where it happened in Ephesians. Um, go with me to, back to chapter 15, verse number 32. Paul says, If after the manner of men I have fought with beasts at Ephesus, that gave you a sense the whole entire city was against the man. He says, verse 32, What advantage it for me, or what is there for me to, to gain, if the dead rise not? He says, they are willing to kill me. Why would I go through all this if there's no hope of a resurrection and reward for the suffering? Now, I love this. Let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. He says, let's eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. That should be the sense, if you have no hope, just do whatever you want. Enjoy this life. Eat, drink. Because, hey, tomorrow you die. Now, that's a quote from the book of Isaiah. Go with me to uh, Isaiah 22. Go back to the Old Testament, Isaiah 22. Paul, because there are Jews at Corinth, the, the Corinthians were a mixed group of saints in the body. There were Jews who got saved into the body, and obviously there were Gentiles. And what Paul would do in his early epistles especially is he'd quote Old Testament passages that the Jews could think about and say, okay, we get it, we get it. If there's no hope in this life beyond this life, if there's no hope beyond this life, Paul says don't waste your time restraining yourself, fighting the, the, the carnal passions. Just go for it. Live like the heathens live. But if there is a God and there's a, a, God, a, count, a day of accountability for us believers, then we live based upon the Lord, the righteous judge. Notice what he says here in Isaiah 22. Look at verse 12. Isaiah 22, verse 12. Isaiah is prophesying about the day of the Lord. He says, and, and in that day did the Lord God of hosts call to weeping. So he's looking back from Israel, sorry. He calls to weeping and to mourning and to baldness and to girding with sackcloth. Think about it. God is calling his people to repentance, but they're not going to repent. Notice verse 13. Here's the quote. And behold, joy and gladness, slaying oxen and killing sheep, eating flesh and drinking wine, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we shall die. Israel had no thought about their God. They refused to live and to worship him the way he said. God called his solemn feast and they said, ah, we don't care about it, we're going to do what we want, Lord. And that's what Paul is saying. That was right before he judges them. God says, okay, you want to live that way? And he put the Gentile heathens on them, okay? Well, that's what Paul is talking about. Go to the book of Luke, Luke chapter number 12, as we head back. 
Look at Luke chapter number 12. See what the Lord says. Luke 12. And verse 19. Luke chapter number 12. <laughs> he tells a parable about this guy. So maybe we need to look at it. Look at Luke chapter 12, verse 15. Uh, some of you guys might be familiar, but there's probably others who are not. I love this passage. Look at Luke chapter 12, verse 15. Here's how mankind lives life. Like, everything is going to go on forever, and there's just no accountability. You ain't going to die one day and see the righteous judge. Notice, notice this guy right here, verse 15. So two men came and says, uh, well, to get the, to get the uh, context, look at verse 13. Luke 12, verse 13. And one of the company said unto him, that's the Lord, Master, speak to my brother that he divide the inheritance with me. These guys are so earthly minded, Christ is telling them to sell all. Don't worry about this stuff here. And they say, Lord, our father's on the, in, in the death, he, he, he's, he's close to death, so we're, we're, we're going to have an inheritance. Oh, um, have my brother divide that inheritance with me. Watch the Lord. He's not going to be worried about these trivial matters. Verse 14, he said unto, them, unto him, Man, who made me a judge or divider over you? He's like, that's not my job. Why do I care about that? Verse 15, he said unto them, Take heed and beware of covetousness. For a man's life consisted not in the abundance of the things which he possesseth. Isn't it the Lord who says, What does a... What, what does a uh, what's there? I, I had my, my mind on this one. Um... What does it profit a man to gain the whole world and yet lose his what? His own, his own soul. And what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? The people of our world is all about getting money and power and fame and fortune, blah, blah, blah. All that stuff is going to go down <coughs> in smoke. Watch this. A man's life consisted not in the abundance of things which he possesseth. Verse 16. And he spake a parable unto them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plenty. And he thought within himself, saying, what shall I do? Because I have no room where to bestow my fruits. The man was so profitable, he didn't have storage enough for his profits. So he goes, I'm going to look, look what he does. Verse 18, he said, this will I do. I will pull down my barns and build greater. And there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods. Now watch this conversation he has with himself. I, and I will say to my soul, verse 19, soul... Thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. And basically the Lord is going to say, because tomorrow you're going to die, man. <laughs> Watch this. This guy, that's how the world looks at things. Man, we're so profitable. We got all, we getting all, yeah. It's only for a time. Go ahead, eat, drink, and be merry. But watch this. But God said unto him, yeah, verse 20, Thou what? Fool. A fool says in his heart, there's no God. Foolish thinking doesn't have God in their knowledge. That's what Paul's going to say. He's going to say, away to righteousness. For some have not the knowledge of God. The world lives like this. But watch what happened. This, this fool is saying all this, and God comes to him and says, uh, thou fool. Snapped out of it. Yeah. But, he, but now God is going to, he's going to, give, he's going to give it to this guy. Look at verse 20. This night, the same night he says, man, I got all this stuff. God says, you're going to die. This night thy soul shall be required of thee. Mm -hmm. Then who shall those things be which thou hast provided? God says, you built all that stuff and it's going to go to somebody else. You ain't going to enjoy it. <laughs> so, verse 21, is he that layeth up treasure for himself and is not rich toward who? You know what we're to do as grace believers? Paul says we're to lay up in store for the time to come. He says we need to lay up the fruits of righteousness that go before, which are by Jesus Christ. We're not trying to gain in this world. I don't know about y'all, but especially since I'm looking for the Lord. Nothing in this world, I don't care about anything in this world, but, but you guys, my family and you guys, the saints. I'm looking for the Lord to return so we can go on and serve him up there. We just have that in our hearts. Well, that's what Paul is saying. Go back with me, if you will, to 1 Corinthians 15. So we should just be looking. Doesn't mean we don't take care of the business of this world. I still get up. Go minister to my singers every morning. You've got to see my wife and the, the saints here and through the internet and so forth. You get a lot of contact. But really, my heart is, my affection is up there. I'm telling you guys now. Yeah, more than, more than ever. And not just for me, for all of us. 
the same. I, I tell you, I get these notes and stuff, and, and, and many of them are thankful, but a, a lot of times they share their pain with us too. When I say us, Chris and I. And sometimes I don't put it on you guys. Just I just say we pray for those saints because I hear all the satanic attack that saints who stick with the right divided word are going through. And it's not just our group here. It's the folks who follow by way of internet. They contact me and tell me the good and the bad. It's on my heart and on my soul. And I pray that God comes to relieve them as well of that. Well, look what Paul says. Verse number 33. Be not deceived. Evil communication corrupt good manners. Now what's that? That issue of be not deceived. Paul will say, be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. Right? Galatians. Paul would say, be not deceived because of all these sinful things, the wrath of God comes upon the children of disobedience. Here, when he says, be not deceived, evil communication corrupt good manners. This is what he's saying. Bad doctrine equals bad conduct. When we say, mind your manners to our children, and we got little children here, we got to say that a lot, don't we? Mind your manners. What do we mean? Watch your conduct. Conduct yourself properly. And when Paul says evil communication, if you're listening to bad doctrine, it equals bad conduct. That's why he says, listen to me. Look at verse number 34. Awake. Paul talks about awake. Awake to righteousness. Awake to righteousness. The right thinking, the right acting. And you can only do that based upon the word of God's grace. So Paul says to awake to righteousness and sin not. Okay. Remember, also Paul says you be uh, be angry and sin not. But here, when he talks about awake to righteousness, he's saying awake to understanding what God's doing. Because notice he says for verse thirty four, some have not the knowledge of God. I speak this to your what shame. Sometimes Paul would say, I speak not this to shame you, but as my beloved sons, I warn you. First Corinthians four. But sometimes Paul has to shame. Uh, we have children here, in, in, you know, in the assembly and so forth that my wife takes care of and so forth. And with parents, we want to show you from Scripture how to deal with them. Sometimes you need to shame them to teach them a lesson. Other times, you don't. Well, Paul dealt with them as children. He says, I speak this to your shame. They were glorying in their misunderstanding of God's Word. There were actually people saying there was no physical resurrection, and Paul says, if that's true, how did Christ raise from the dead? And if Christ not raised, then we all doomed. Well, look at verse 35. So some wise guy, some wise cracker is going to say, verse 35. This is what Paul's going to do. He's going to deal with all the objections. Look at verse 35. But some man will say, he already knows somebody's going to say something. Can I tell you guys, start sharing the rightly divided word. You're going to have people come with all these objections, some, some wise man can see. Paul already knows by giving truth, people are going to go against it. So here's one of them. Look at verse 35. Oh, I think I just, verse 35. But some man will say, Come on, Paul, how are the dead raised up? Oh, and what and with what body do they come? You know, the Sadducees during the Lord's earthly ministry, the religious leaders, the Sadducees, they didn't believe in the resurrection. They didn't believe in spirits, anything. And so to try to trap the Lord Jesus, they went to him and they said, hmm, you always talk about resurrection, Jesus. We don't believe it, but flatter us, if you will. You know, Moses says that if a man died in Israel, he was married, but he didn't have a seed, his brother, if it was possible, should marry his wife and have a son. And although that would be his brother's biological son is really his nephew because that son goes to the dead man. It's called the law of the, of the brother. And so this woman, she's with one brother and he has all these other brothers and they all kept dying. They were, he was, they were giving him a hypothetical. They all kept dying without ever giving a child. So in the resurrection, whose wife would she be? But they like, let's hear what this guy said. The Lord says, thou do err not knowing the scriptures, fools. <laughs> He says, in the resurrection, there is no marriage or given in marriage. They're like the angels of God. There's no procreation. Don't need it because they're raised up. 
Well, Paul is going to deal with similar <coughs> questions about the resurrection. So how are the dead raised up, and with what body do they come? And you know what Paul said to this person? A oh, fool. Same thing the Lord said over there, thou fool. Fools don't think about God. Fool says in his heart there's no God. Now watch what Paul says. Thou fool. It's a foolish question because just look at... Go over to Romans chapter 1. Go over to Romans chapter 1. This is the most beautiful thing. Remember we did that study on God, how you can know God from the creation? God put in man, Adam, our, our father, in us, a way to see invis the invisible God by what we can see in creation, the visible. Watch what Paul says in Romans 1. Look at verse number 19. Romans 1, 19. Because that which may be known of God, it may be known of Him. Doesn't mean they're going to know it. They don't have the knowledge of God, but they can know it. Verse 19. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them. For God hath showed it unto them. For, for the invisible things of Him. God is an invisible God, but you can see Him clearly if you want. Here's how. For the invisible things of Him from the creation of the world are clearly seen. I heard an atheist Jew once on, I keep the sports radio on in my, in my uh, car when I'm driving my scenes around. This guy is an atheist Jewish guy. He says it. He said he took his daughter to the zoo and he was just looking at a good giraffe, just looking at it. He was just marveling. He, he said this right on here. He says, you know, when I look at that giraffe, it's got to be a God. Like, how can this thing exist? It's the beauty and the proportion it was even on. He was like, he was an atheist. He goes, but there's got, it's got to be a God. This other agnostic, he calls himself, he says when he's over in the Pacific Northwest and in California and the different parts of, of Canada, the beauty is so awe-inspiring. He goes, he goes, God must have got to like Cleveland and said, I'm done. You know, he was like, <laughs> it's beautiful in the West. He got to Cleveland and said, I'm done. <laughs> he's joking about it, but he mentioned God. Because you can tell there is, there has to be a creator. Be, oh, look what he said. Verse number 20. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made. Even his eternal power and Godhead, who he is, his nature, his character, so that they are what? Without excuse. Nobody's going to say, God, I didn't know, ma'am. And that day of judgment, that great white throne, they can't say, man, I didn't know. Oh, you know. Verse number 21. Because when they knew God, they glorified not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imagination. And those fool, their foolish heart was darkened. Here's why. Because they became professors. They professed themselves to be wise. That's the problem. They became fools. And changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image. See, we saw those guys over in Acts. The image made like unto corruptible man, us, to birds, to four-footed beasts and even creeping things. And God gave them up, over, and so forth. The problem is, when you're trying to be wise and your wisdom doesn't come from God's word, you're a fool in the eyes of God. Most atheists have brilliant minds. You ever notice that? They're some of the most intellectual, brilliant minds and they're the biggest fools on earth. <laughs> the biggest fools on earth. One of them who died a couple years ago, I think his name was Christopher Hitchin. He was so mocking Christians, he says, you Christians this, you Christians that. He says, what makes you a true Christian? You guys can't even get it right amongst yourselves. Now watch what this guy said. He says, what makes you a Christian, you Christians? This, this. I checked it out. Number one, you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and that he died on the cross for your sins. An uh, atheist said that. He was mocking Christendom by saying, y'all can't get your own gospel right. He said that. I go, you can't say it better than that. <laughs> that Jesus is the Son of God and that he died on the cross for sins. He said that he was mocking us. You guys can't get it right. These fools know. He's dead now. He knows now. <laughs> we'll see you one day. He also said that Paul said something completely different than Jesus did. In That's right. Ministry. Thank you. Thanks for that. He just read the Bible like a normal person. He read the Bible. Obviously, he's an unbeliever. But he read the Bible. And you know what else he said? I forgot. You're right, right? King James, too. You would well, use well, He read the King Christopher Hitchin. All right. He read the King James Bible, by the way. Not only did he say what I just said, Ryan reminded me. He said that you Christians can't even get 
who to follow right because Paul said stuff, stuff different than what Jesus said in his earthly ministry. He wasn't corrupted by denomination. Exactly. He just read the Bible no. plainly. Yes. By the way, exactly. by the way, the Muslims believe that too. They can see that the Jews Paul, that Jews too. The only people who don't is believers in the body of Christ. <laughs> right. Everybody else can see that Paul's going to the Gentiles. He said different than. What about the fact that we have different versions of the Bible too? Yeah. Muslims only have one. Catholics only have one. I mean, that too. I, it's it's so many things. But what's what the beautiful thing is, God put in creation. Go back to First Corinthians fifteen. Something as simple, you know, when the Lord would talk during his earthly ministry, he would talk about simple things like agricultural things that people can understand. The sower sows the seed, the seed is the word, the ground is the hearts of men. You know, a little simple stuff that anybody can get. Watch what Paul says about this. Go back to chapter 15 of 1 Corinthians. He's going to use some of the simplest, one of the simplest things to show resurrection. Something as simple as, planting a seed in, in soil. Watch this. Verse 35. But some man will say, how are the dead raised up? And, and with what body do they come? Paul responds, thou fool, that which thou sowest is not quickened except it die. <coughs> now hold your hand there and go to John chapter 12. Hold your hand there. I'm going to show you what the Lord said. Over to, to Israel. He said the same thing. Look at John chapter 12. <coughs> go back a couple of books to John chapter 12. And look at verse 24, if you will. Start at verse 23. John 12, 23. And Jesus answered them, saying, The hour is come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Now again, he understands he's going to go and die, be buried and raised again. Okay, look at the next verse, verse 24. Verily, verily, you ever wonder why he says it like that, truly, truly, or verily, verily, twice? Because when when he when, when Christ deals with Israel, it's always his first coming and his second coming. So it applies when he was there and when he returned. Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and do what? That's, that seed dies there in that ground. That's the picture when we bury someone six feet under, six to the number of man. You put that body in there knowing that that body will one day rise up out of there. Even lost people are going to be resurrected. At the great white throne, they're resurrected. And then they're thrown into the lake of fire. But the point is, notice what he says in verse 24, John 12. Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. Listen, you can hold a seed in your hand and that thing will just stay like that, right? It's all along. But I can take that seed and over the course of time, bury it, it dies, it begins to raise a newness of life, but then it bears even more fruit. We can feed the whole uh, assembly. That's what he's saying. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. And what the Lord Jesus Christ is pointing to, to himself, he says, I have to die. But when I am glorified, I'm going to bring forth much fruit, eternal life. Can I tell you something? You know why Paul tells us to be, our, to be living sacrifices? Because a sacrifice dies. Dies daily, like Paul. You, if you and I had selfless lives, the Lord, he, let's say he does tarry a year or two, whatever. I hope not. Come, Lord. I'll be coming this week. Y'all know how to do that. But let's say he does. If each and every one of us used our life as a living sacrifice to bless other saints, just, with just our own brethren, it bears much fruit. See a seed, you, you, you plant it, and it comes up and it bears a huge fruit tree. That's what he's saying. That's a spiritual law, but it's a, nat it's a natural law. It's a spiritual law. If you can understand the natural laws, you can understand what ha happens in the spirit realm. Let's look at it. Verse number 36, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 36. Thou fool, except that which, excuse me, thou fool, that which thou sowest is not quickened or made alive and, 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 and brought to life and so forth. 
except it dies. So the seed dies, like the Lord said in John 12. Now, in addition to that, look at verse 37. And that which thou sowest, thou sowest not that body that shall be. You can put that little seed in there. It's not going to come out looking like that. It's going to come up with a new body. Notice. Keep going. Verse 37. And that which thou sowest, thou sowest not that body that shall be. But bear grain, it may chance, of wheat or some other grain. <coughs> he says whatever grain you want to use, it doesn't matter. It's going to look different when it comes out, though. Let's keep going. You ever see an apple? You know, my, our daughter likes fruit. And the, and the apple, you know, the seeds and stuff. Those seeds look crazy, but they, they, they end up coming to this beautiful little fruit, right? There's all these types of apples. I'm going to take my singers to Apple Hill um, next week. They get all these apples and stuff. They carry all these different apples. But it starts with that little tiny seed, and it comes with this big tree. Well, you, you can talk to Ryan. He, his, his family has that organic farm. He sells the olive oil and so forth. That's their whole business. That's what Paul is saying. Notice what it says in verse number 38. But who? God. Giveth it a body as it hath pleased him, and to every seed his own body. You see that? God has chosen not only what the seed is, what that body comes out. And if you can understand all that, God is going to do the same with us, his people, at the resurrection, at the rapture. Now, let's keep going. Verse number 39. All flesh is not the same flesh, but there is one kind of flesh of men. So all us human beings have the same flesh, right? We feel the same. But then if your dog is sitting there, he has a different... So he talks about there's one kind of flesh of men, verse 39, another flesh of beasts, a dog, a cow, a different beast, another of fishes, fishes have a different type of flesh, and another of birds. But then he goes into another stratosphere. That's just right here on earth. Paul is going to say that heaven and earth have different types of bodies, the, the beings there. So let's look at it. Verse 40. There, uh, there are also celestial bodies. Uh, that celestial, in other places, it's, it's translated heavens or heavenly places or high places. He's talking about the heavenly bodies. And then there's bodies terrestrial or earthly. This is called terra firma. The earth is terra firma. Firm. They differ. The bodies up there versus here. Keep going. Verse 40. But the glory of the celestial is one, being one type of glory, and the glory of the ter terrestrial is another. Now, can I tell you something? They're all beautiful. God made them, but they're different. Okay? There's different glory. Look at verse 41. There is one glory of the sun. I mean, you can see the, the sun just beaming brightly. But then there's times at night. We were in Seattle recently, and we were over the Puget Sound, the waters, and it was a huge full moon. It was almost like right there. I guess we can see it sometimes here, too. It's right there. I've been watching the moon cycles, Jack, because that waxy crescent moon, and I told Chris the last night we came to do the prepare the place here, and it was, it was larger. So it's just going to keep going until it's a full moon, and then it's going to wane. It's going to go the other way. Hopefully we're already gone by then. <laughs> Do you know that that's how mankind kept time before <laughs> anything? Uh, you see what it says? Let me, let me show you some stuff from Genesis. Interesting. Look what Paul says here, verse number 41. There is one glory of the sun. Okay. Not Sunday. Sun. Okay. Another glory of the moon. You can see some beautiful bright moons and so forth, crescent moons. Waxing crescent means it's getting bigger. Waning crescents are getting smaller. Full moons, new moon. The new moon, waxing crescent moon. How Israel began that. Well, not just Israel. I'm going to show you that all, all civilization did. God, mankind did. Yeah, Israel. Man did. How did they know where the feast days, where, how did they know where they were in time and so forth? All that stuff. I'm going to show you something. There's one glory of the sun and, and another glory of the moon. And another glory of the stars. <coughs> stars. That includes all the star clusters and stuff and, and what we call planets and all that. So stars. But let me show you what Paul says as he ends that little passage in verse 41. For one star differeth.
from another star in glory. Now, when we look up there, particularly the, the little stars that we see, they all look very similar. Some are brighter, some are... <clears throat> but when you, you know, the other, the, the greater stars that God made, like the, what we call planets, look at them. Jupiter looks like that, Earth looks like that, Mars looks like that, Saturn looks like that. They even differ when you can see them, right? But why God did that is because the sun, moon, and stars was how man could tell time. And not just time during the day, but over the course of time. How, how God gave to mankind to know when to worship Him, how to worship Him. I'm going to show you something. Adam didn't have a calendar like that. You, God didn't say, here's your calendar, Adam. <laughs> this is the first day. There to, God put it so everybody, the heavens declare the glory of God, and the, and the, and the firmament showed his handiwork day after day, in other speech, and night after night. Mankind all over the earth could just tell where we were by looking in the stars. They could even know where, where the different stars were in the different uh, uh, seasons and stuff. Let me show you that. Go to Genesis chapter 1. Go back, back to Genesis. Sometimes we make the mistake of saying, and I was, I, was, I did it too, we were limiting what God was doing, but we'll talk about Israel's feast day. Although it's true that God dealt with his one nation in the earth in time past on this calendar, he made it for man. Because they all were understanding these things. Interesting that at a certain point in civilization, you can even see there was a change from a 360-day year to a 365-day year. And it would go back and forth and stuff like that. Interesting. Can't get into that now. But let me show you how mankind, what, how God made it so that every civilization could know where we were. What season, when all the so forth we need. Even the days. Even the hours of the day. Look at verse number. Everybody know Genesis? That's when God does the creation. Okay. The recreation for Adam, particularly. Where do birds come from? God. We were talking about this in the Q and A. The best is in the Q and A. We stay for hours. That's where we get the best information. Uh, I got y'all got to watch Ryan do this. Ryan, I'm gonna make everybody stay one day. You just put it on. He does a great job of showing how the creation was before the flood and before the fall. Before the flood, it changed at the flood of Noah. But he does an awesome job. I can't. I can't recreate it. He can do it. Maybe he'll do that before uh, he leaves or something. All right, look at this. But the way we see the, the creation now was different than how he originally done, created it for Adam. Something changed at the flood. That's where the waters come, the seas that we have and stuff. So God changed some things up. But what I want you to see is, notice, because uh, I think it was uh, Daniel asked about the firmament. Go to verse 6. Genesis 1 6. And God said, Let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. Ryan does a great job showing all this. And God made the firmament and divided the waters which are under the firmament from the waters which are above the firmament, and it was so. Remember, he had he had judged the, the, the satanic rebellion and these little creatures, Satan, that, and that's where we get the dust of the ground and all that. And he judged that stuff. It was water, it was darkness, and God began to lift those waters out and bring dry land upon the earth. Verse 9, And God said, Let the waters under the heaven be gathered together into one place, unto one place, and let the dry land appear, and it was so. And God called the dry land earth, and the gathering together of the waters he called seas, and God saw that it was good. So then he brings forth the fruits and so forth. Now, verse 14 is what I want you to see. And God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven." Now, by the way, it wasn't just to give light. He had said earlier, let there be light. Do you understand? You can have light without the sun, moon, and stars. He already had light. But he's going to put the sun, moon, and stars to help us understand where we at in time. All right, keep going. Verse number 14, God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night. And let them be for what? Signs and for seasons, and for days, and for years. The main reason God put the sun, moon, and stars, God deals with humanity with time on a solar, lunar, for years, months, and so forth, and then even positional 
as on how you say that's whatever stars is all that combination so you can know where he's at and God did that from the beginning and yes he dealt with uh, yes he dealt with the nation of Israel like that but he was dealing with mankind like that Israel didn't show up to thousands of years after creation God was dealing how did man know when to worship God those are the feasts of the Lord they were worshiping on those feast days that he gave Israel but they the only way you can do it is that and something changed it was 360 but if you kept on that if that was constant you'd have one feast day it was a fall feast all in the summer and it'd be all screwed up so there was some adjustments and so forth and you can see that God did something something cataclysmic happened to move the entire civilizations at the same time move there and it could have been when God moved that the sun for Hezek, in the days of Hezekiah and then there was a moment to Joshua the missing day but then he moved the sun it seems like in the days of Hezekiah it's called the sundown of Ahaz it was a sign let it be for sign because God says I'll give you he says you're going to die Hezekiah king of Israel but he said oh Lord give me some more time God says to the prophet okay tell him I'll give him some more time I'll give him 15 years and a sign to him is going to move some things. He, he, he moves some, some things around. And he, he does. I believe that could have been when this thing changed. But anyway, something cataclysmic is going to happen in the time of Jacob's trouble, too, to kind of re, re flip these things back to that. But that's a whole other thing. I just want you to see that when God did all that, he was doing that not just for Israel, it's for humanity. That's God's calendar. And he operates so that we can know where are we at in, in, in the year, the month, and, 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 and the positioning of the stars and so forth. Okay? But all those things, let's let's uh let's look at verse 15 and 16 and we'll get back to our, our passage. Look at Genesis 1 15, and let them be, okay, so they're for signs, seasons, for days, years. You guys gotta talk to Matt about this and say, he knows all his he got that scientific mind, I don't. We're coming up on the autumnal, I can't ever say that word, the autumn equinox coming up. Then there's one, there's another. It, 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 God has all this stuff ready for the earth. But remember, the day of the Lord, he's going he's gonna, to he's gonna move the earth out of its place and stuff. Something's going to happen cataclysmic to change some things. All through the prophets. And you know, the Lord said that the last seven years, yea, three and a half years before the return on this earth to set up his kingdom, it's going to be the worst time the earth has seen from the creation. Islam's going to move it in to conquer and to conquer. And, and, and through these refugees, this, I can see it being set up. They're just going to infiltrate everywhere. Yeah. The Lord's going to have to come back and stop it. So he won't destroy every Jew and Christian on the planet. That's what they want to do. As they're going into these European nations, you know what we saw earlier? That Allah, they're shouting that as they're coming into their country. These people are taking them in and these guys go, Allah, Allah, Allah. They're, gonna, they're not going to assimilate. The Italian prime minister says, we're going to lose our, we're going to lose our identity. That's right. They are. Verse 15 and 16, and let them be for lights in the firmament of heaven to give light upon the earth. How nice is God that at night in that darkness, you see that veil that, comes, that, that shields the third heaven for now? You can be at night and you can get a beautiful moon. It can light up everything in the stars. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for giving us lights at night. Notice verse 16, and God made two great lights. The greater light to rule the day, the sun, and the lesser light to rule the night, the moon. Oh yeah, and he made the stars also. That's all the plans, all the stars, everything. Verse 17, and we'll end. And in this passage, we go back. And God set them in the firmament of the heaven, it's what we would call like outer space, to give light upon the earth, okay? So the heaven is made up of the first heaven. That's the atmosphere, the air where the birds and the planes fly. Then the second heaven is where we have the planets, the stars, you know, we'll call the planets, the star clusters, the sun, moon, stars. And then above that is the third heaven, that's God's domain eternity from Isaiah. That's where God's domain is. Now go back. All of that stuff God made with different glory. By the way, 
with technology, we can actually get out there and see this stuff. But God made this known from the beginning. And had Adam not fallen, man would have had the ability to go search it out. Don't get Ryan started on how, how the waters were above here and the, the whales were up there. You're walking to aquarium. You ever wonder why aquariums, you walk in there and then they always put this glass above you, right? And then into the sides and you see these creatures you're just walking you feel like you're under the sea, right? Why, why the infinity of putting it above you? Because that's how it was. And Adam could just go up there and check things out and come on down. It was different than it is now. The flood changed all of that. All right. What did I tell you go? Um, first, oh, first Corinthians. Yeah, go back to First Corinthians. We got about eight minutes. First Corinthians, chapter number fifteen. So I put Ryan on the spot. So y'all make him do it. Make him make him draw it for you one day if he, if he wants to. He is, he just, you guys were there, right? You did a great job. Just yeah. I'm, I'm gonna make him do it real big on the day and just teach it. It's beautiful. He, it's a glimpse of what the world looked like before the flood. It was awesome. Okay? Alright, let's keep going. And by the way, we're gonna be able to see all this. When the Lord does come, when we explore the heavenly places, it's gonna be so hard, we're just gonna be like, what? This is bad. Man, please. Y'all don't know. We're so limited in this life, this domain, this 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 realm, this dimension. My heart, I want to I wanna see what our Father has for us out there, man. All right, let's keep going. But until he comes, we just patiently wait. Here we go. All right, verse number 41. There is one glory of the sun and another glory of the moon and another glory of the stars. That's what I went back to Genesis, because when he puts them together like that, he wants you to go back to Genesis. For one star differeth from another star in glory. So also is the resurrection of the dead. Now, we're going to end, and maybe next week I'll pick it up, but the resurrection and judgment seat happen together. When Paul talks about the rapture, he talks about the judgment seat. Based upon your faithfulness now, the, the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ, you built up now. Righteousness. Your practical righteousness. Because we're all righteous positionally in Christ, right? Your practical righteousness, your sanctification. Based upon that, which will be determined by the Lord Jesus at the judgment seat, the glory of Christ that you bear, how do I say it? The glory that you bear based upon your, your, your faithfulness and loyalty to him now in the mystery, in the grace message, Paul's message, your practical sanctification righteousness, it's going to equal the glory that you bear in your body forever. And just like in the military, you can tell by looking at their uniform, yay, any, any insignia on their uniform, their, 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 the glory of their position. If you saw a four-star general, you could tell him from a private. Based upon what their clothes, their clothing, and even what they've earned in their medals. See, and where do we get that from? You can just look at a person and based upon how they're dressed. You can do that with people. If a guy walks in with a nice Italian three-piece suit or something in nice shoe, you say, that man must got some money. Or look, pretending like he do, right? <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. That's why I paint that by now. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> or somebody you just come in and be like, hey, man, I'm like a bomb. You say, I don't know what this guy got. <laughs> then you can have somebody like me, a, a, a very gifted fashionista, my, my wife. Everything we get is from the thrift store. He wouldn't even know because she, she got it right for it. Can't tell. But I'm saying, you can even look at people and what they're wearing. It, it, it gives off a sense of who they are, right? Well, that's what it's going to be. Based upon your loyalty, your practical righteousness and sanctification now, that's why we got to do what we do. We're going to bear that glory forever, okay? And not every saint is going to have the same glory. Some will be more glorious. That's why he says in verse 41 and 42, as we come down in, there is one glory of the sun. It's glorious, but... They, when you compare the moon to the sun, although they're both glorious, the glory of the moon pales in comparison to the sun. One star, verse 41, different from another star in glory. You know what's crazy? God has made every star have different glory. 
Every human being that ever lived. Let me, let me boast on our Creator. Every human being that ever lived has a different fingerprint. To the point you commit a crime, they got your fingerprint, it's you. There's been probably, we know multiple, multiple, multiple billions of people on earth right now. Everybody has different. Now go all the way back to Adam. How did God get, just, he, he only got that much space to work with. How he did everybody different. But I'm going to freak you out even more. They claim, they say, that every snowflake is different. Do you know how much snow falls in the Arctic and man doesn't see it? God just does it for his own enjoyment. And they're all different. A little snowflake. That's our God. That's, that's mind-blowing. How is he that creative that he can... You're going you to make like trillions of different things on that little thing. Yep, I am. I got it. <laughs> Man, nobody's going to see that, Father. It just becomes a mound of snow that nobody sees. I see it. The angels see it. I mean, come on, man. That's our Father. You think we're not special? People want to be special. You're a human being. You're a human soul. You're a special God. Lost or saved, you're special. And then if you, in faith, trust Christ as your Savior and He accepts you as beloved Son in Christ, you even more. Oh, man, you're special. Listen, we got to end, but notice, verse 42, so also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown. It is buried. It is buried in corruption, a planet in corruption. It is raised in what? In corruption. That corrupt body of that dead, it's going to be raised never to corrupt again. Keep going. Verse 43, it is sown in dishonor. nothing like seeing a dead body in a casket, man. I did Brother James. I can't wait to see Brother James Mason soon. The rapture. I remember doing his, his funeral. His body was right there. That's when he hit his wife. I we got it. Sister Jane, she's a strong woman out of Minnesota. They've been married all, over 40 years. Great family, great children. And she was all right. She missed him. She was, but when she walked up in there and saw his body. This is her husband with his carcass. He, she knows he's with the Lord. She knows. When she saw that, she was just like, that was it for her. <clears throat> it is sown in dishonor. There's no honor here. But when we see Brother James, I can see his smiling face right now. Man. I can see it. It is, it, is, it is raised in what? Glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in, in what? Power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body. There is a spiritual body, the one the Lord has. And so it is written. We got to end here. It is written. The first man, Adam, was made a living soul. God used that little dust that he destroyed. So Satan looked at He said, let me show you how it's done. Took that little dust. Dust is just... It's the it's the, the offspring. It's the, it's the uh, part of the body that decayed, right? So there was some creatures there. He used that little dust and said, "Let me make man in our image after our likeness." Evidently, Satan was trying to make some things. Maybe that crow magnet man, some other things. And God flooded that. And he says, "You know that little dust? Let me use it." We got in. Ryan, he just makes me. I marvel. Do you guys know what fossil? You know what fossil fuels are? Fossil fuels, right? We get oil and stuff. <laughs> when God flooded the earth and all those bodies died, <clears throat> God just a recycler. He just uses the fuels. <laughs> and why it's a lot, a lot, a lot based in the Middle East particularly is because most of the people at that time were in the Middle East. There are people all around, but most of the oil is in the Middle East. Fossil fuel. It's the dead carcasses of the people dying in the flood, and God just now using it to, 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 to heat up the earth. Power of death. Power of death. And, we, and if there's ever some nuclear warfare that takes place over there, it's sitting, there's oil all over there. Can you imagine that thing? Boom! It's going to blow up in flame. The only, we got to end. It says that the Lord Jesus himself has to come and stop that from happening because it would just destroy the entire Eventually, the entire earth, but definitely the entire Middle East, which is everybody would just be as, as incinerated. But even fossil fuels, that's got the power. That's fantastic. Thank you, Lord. All right, we have to end.
if you're listening and you never were blessed enough to have someone ask you, where would your soul spend forever? Where is it going to go? It's going to go somewhere. If you're not sure that it's going to go to heaven, and, and then if you think it's going to heaven, based upon what? And if your answer is not the blood of Jesus Christ alone, you won't cut it. you got to know for sure that it's the blood of Christ alone. But Christ, when he shed his blood on the cross for us, for all of us, and, we, and it's imputed by faith alone, no works, God gives us that everlasting life. He'll never take it back. It's a free gift. But if you're saved, and you, if you just got saved, there is a judgment to come, the judgment seat of Christ. That's going to determine your glory that you're going to bear for the Lord Jesus forever. Your, your, whether you reign with Christ or simply just be in the heavenly places. That's good enough, being in the heavenly places. That's good. But God did not apprehend Paul and us just to get into heaven and hold the doors to rule and reign in Christ's stead up there. Why not, why not do that? You can only do it by knowing the mystery. That's why we go verse by verse in Paul's epistle. The more of this understanding we have, the greater the glory we're going to bear and share with the Lord Jesus, okay? All right, let's redeem the time. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the word of truth, rightly divided. We thank you for one another as saints here. I, I, I personally thank you for all these wonderful brothers and sisters in Christ, these saints. I thank you for those who follow by way of internet who use this ministry to receive some edification, even though it may be limited because they don't have other flesh and blood members to, to hold and to talk to and hug and, and be encouraged. But we thank you that through the blessing of technology, we can get them out there. But Father, we all look forward to the day where we all can be together. I look forward to all these saints that I haven't seen in the flesh, but who contact our ministry and they, 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 they are edified through it. I look forward to the day that we can all be together and spend time together and just rejoice in Christ Jesus together. We do it now, Father, but it's not complete. It's not filled yet. May all of our hearts, be, our affection be set on things above, not on things on this earth. We say, come Lord Jesus, until, but until you do, we say thank you for another day of grace, another day to learn your word and share it with others. We actually bless our time together in Q&A as well. We thank you in Christ's name.